It is my privilege today to introduce our honored guest, Murray Gordon, who is a Lithuanian Holocaust survivor. Murray was a resistance fighter during the war. Later, he was captured and ended up in Dachau concentration camp with his father. After the war, Murray came to New York and eventually settled in California. He fell in love and married his lovely wife, Janet. He created a new life, becoming an integral part of the family business, Marcus Hardware. Concurrently, he built a large real estate portfolio. But by far his proudest accomplishment is the creation of his beautiful family. Murray's story is one of inspiration during a time of desperation. It's the resilience of the human spirit, never losing hope and actively fighting evil. For those of you who know Murray, you have noticed his sharp sense of humor, how much he loves people and felt his kindness. So it is my pleasure at this time to give you Murray. I was born in Klaipeda, which is a seaside resort town of the Baltic Sea in pre-World War II Lithuania. When I was six years old, we moved to Kaunas, the capital of Lithuania, so my mother could be closer to her parents and siblings. Kaunas was a beautiful cultural city. It was surrounded by two rivers. Both rivers used to freeze in the winter. We used to skate, and in the summer we used to fish. Life was very pleasant in Lithuania. The president, Antanas Smetona, was a good man. In school, I was on the basketball team, and academically, I excelled in math, history, languages, and music. In June of 1940, the Soviet Union occupied the three Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. Even though the population didn't like the Soviets, the majority of the Jewish people felt secure with them because there was no secret how Hitler was treating the Jews in Germany. Everybody felt that Germany wouldn't attack the Soviets, especially after the non-aggression treaty that both countries had signed. Life under the Soviets was not pleasant for property and business owners. The new government confiscated their property and businesses and relocated them to different areas. A lot of people were also arrested. The first thing the authorities did was to brainwash the children, starting from kindergarten age. In school, we got new textbooks and had to learn the teachings of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Stalin. We had to participate in weekly political meetings and discussions. We were told that communism was superior to any other form of government. As youngsters, we really didn't understand what was happening. We participated in a lot of sports like soccer, basketball, skiing, and tennis. On a cultural level, we went to concerts, operas, lectures, debates, and chess tournaments. Life began to take a certain normalcy, and we started to get used to the new order until June 22. A year earlier, Germany had signed an non-aggression pact with Russia. But on June 21, 1941, the German army attacked the Russian frontier. At first, everyone thought that the Red Army would crush the Germans. But after invading Lithuania, in a few days, the Soviet army retreated and continued to retreat farther into their motherland. At the time, many Jews were also fleeing to Russia, but very few were let in. Some of them were Russian soldiers defending the western border. But even they, when they tried to retreat with the army, were told to fight and hold back the Nazi assault. I was 15, and my brother was 11 and a half years old. We knew the Nazis were antagonistic to the Jewish people even more than the Russians were. When the Germans came and occupied Lithuania, they made many decrees placing severe restrictions against the Jewish population and taking most of the basic privileges away. In the first week after the invasion, Lithuanian collaborators began rounding up Jews on the streets and taking them to be executed outside our towns of Ninth Fort, which was an armament depot from World War I. A few days after Germans entered town, I was walking on the street near our house when suddenly I was approached by four Lithuanian collaborators with shotguns. 
who asked me what I was doing on the street. Fortunately, my Lithuania was perfect. I said I was going to visit a friend, and they said, you'd better be watch out. There are Jews shooting at Lithuanians and German soldiers from the windows. I knew it was a lie because the Jews didn't have any guns. I would have hesitated. They, they would have taken me because the, uh, uh, I was happy to take me. Most Jews in Lithuania tended to speak Yiddish and Russian. And because my Lithuania was flawless, the nationalists took me for a Christian, and that saved my life. Lots of Jews disappeared in the coming week, and their homes were ransacked and confiscated. We began to hear rumors about atrocities toward the Jews, but people were hoping that they were just rumors. Then in August, following the June invasion, the Germans announced that all the Jews in Kaunas, which is Kovno, had to move into a ghetto about 10 miles outside the town. They had to move there on foot. We had to move there on foot, carrying bags and boxes with our belongings on our backs or in baby carriages. Things were out of confusion and nobody knew what to expect. Once we moved to the ghetto, which with as many of our belongings as possible, all the inhabitants of the ghetto were ordered to gather in a large field. While we were standing there, the Germans read the rules and regulations that we were required to obey. There was a small hospital in the ghetto when we arrived. While we were standing there in the field, the SS burned the whole hospital with everybody in it, doctors, nurses, and patients. I remember seeing the flames. We thought they had evacuated everyone, but we found out afterwards that everyone inside was burned alive, in total 80 people. The killings continued. In October, everyone in the ghetto was ordered to gather on a large field. All the people who could not walk were separated from us to be taken to a resort area. My grandparents, two uncles, and their families were in that group. We never saw them again. They were taken to a military fort about 10 miles from the ghetto and shot. Ultimately, over 80,000 Jews were shot at that fort in Kaunas. My father, mother and younger brother and I were left behind to work. With the reminder of the ghetto population, which was divided into groups and worked under the strict supervision of German army guards on construction of the airport, munitions factories, and fortifications. During that time, many people disappeared. Periodically, Nazi soldiers in the Ukrainian SS would come and raid the ghetto, grabbing people and taking them to be shot. Babies and young children were often hidden under beds by their mothers. The children were found would be picked up with a long stick with a rounded end by the little neck, dumped on a truck, and then murdered. I knew there was an underground working out of the ghetto with contacts in the forest. I became involved with some young people who had contacts with the underground. The following year, in 1942, I was smuggled out of the ghetto through a hidden hole in the fence. With my friends, I looked up with some of the people who had escaped from the ghetto previously and contacted Russian soldiers who had not been taken prisoner and who were the nucleus of the underground in the Lithuanian forest. The Russians had their own guns. They told us if we wanted guns, we had to capture Nazi soldiers and take their guns away from them. I spent two years working with the underground in various sabotage and derailing supply trains, blowing up bridges, and gathering intelligence as I spoke perfect German, Russian, and Lithuanian, which was transmitted to the Soviet Army. During this two-year period, I returned to the ghetto several times to visit my family, a mission in itself was very dangerous. My brother was only 12 and a half, too young to join the underground. In January of 1944, at the age of 17, I was involved in a mission to blow up Nazi ammunition and supply train that was on the way to the front lines. There were seven of us. We got there very early. It was still dark. It was snowing. We laid out dynamite on the ground and on the tracks and didn't have to camouflage it as it was snowing. The first explosion was the locomotive, but it kept moving and dragging the rest of the cars as they exploded like a chain reaction. We were successful in destroying the train, but there were five German soldiers in the last car who jumped off and started sh shooting at us. 
We had a shootout with them, and only one soldier survived, but all six of my comrades were killed, or at least they were wounded. I was wounded and lying on the ground, face up, with my eyes half closed, in great pain. My rifle three feet away from me, but I had my revolver in my hand under my coat. A German soldier who, who survived poked and stabbed everybody in the throat with his bayonet to make sure they were dead. When he came to me and was going to stab me, I shot him point blank with my revolver. All six of my comrades were dead. For three hours, I crawled back to the underground camp, losing a lot of blood. When I finally got to our camp, I fainted. The medic, a 30-year-old medical student, couldn't do much for me because I had been shot five times. One bullet missed my heart by two inches, and two bullets lodged inside me. I badly needed blood transfusion, so it was he decided to smuggle me back into the ghetto makeshift hospital. Doctors there gave me blood from one of my ghetto friends and got the bullets out without an anesthetic. Four months later, evacuation of the ghetto began. It was the summer of 1944. When the SS started entering the ghetto, some Jews hid in bunkers they had built under their living quarters. I and eight of my friends stayed in one of those underground bunkers for six days and nights. We had an oxygen tank for daytime, but at night we used to come out for fresh air, water, and food that was left in some of the abandoned ghetto houses. On the seventh day, we thought that we finally made it, but by midday, dogs came and we heard the soldiers yelling, Rouse, get out. They made us climb out, then had us kneel in a row and put our hands behind our heads. We felt sure this was it, that they were going to shoot us on the spot. After they searched us for weapons, they escorted us to, place, to the place from which the ghetto residents were to be shipped off to concentration camps for hard labor to help fortify the German retreat. I looked at one of the guards. He was not a member of the SS, but a regular soldier. I asked him how they found us. He said that the SS had taken away babies from their mothers and promised that no harm would come to them if they would tell where Jews were hiding. It was a cruel trick because the SS lied to them and never returned the babies to the mothers. The Jews were shipped to a settlement camp in Stutthof, Germany. My father and I were separated from my mother and little brother. We finally arrived in Dachau. There were 10 camps in Dachau complex and we were moved from one camp to another. Life in these camps was far, far worse than the ghetto. We slept in makeshift long underground huts covered with grass. There were 100 sleeping spaces, 50 on either side. Most morning when I woke up, there were dead people on both sides of me. Nutrition was very poor, the labor was hard, and once you got the runs, you never recuperated, although most lasted no more than two or three days. My father and I were in Dhaka for 11 months. It was a nightmare. We had to get up at 5.30 a.m. to be counted. It was very cold, and we had to wear those striped pajamas. Then we got some thin broth and had to march for an hour to work. Life was miserable. There were lots of beatings and killings from the SS guards. There were also lots of suicides. Every day there were many deaths. When the Americans came closer, the majority of the inmates were forced to march into the mountains of Bavaria, where all were to be killed. We marched for six days until we came to a large canyon where SS guards and machine guns surrounded us from the top of the canyon. We were very tired. There was no food, no water, and it was cold. We thought for sure this was going to be the end of us, and they were going to shoot us after we had fallen asleep, but nobody cared anymore. In the morning when we woke up, all the SS were gone. All of a sudden there were Japanese-American soldiers. General Patton's forces had liberated us, and the American Red Cross workers came. Of all the experiences I had faced, the liberation still produces the strongest emotions. It's very hard to describe the feeling knowing that you are facing certain death, then all of a sudden find yourself alive and liberated. It is very hard to describe and comprehend, for it was like moving from night to day, from death to life, literally. For a long time, I couldn't talk about the liberation without tears. I made videotapes for my daughters, 
to share my story with them. And when I was describing the liberation, I got very emotional. My mother died on a march from a, from, in a Polish camp two days before the liberation. My little brother had been gassed along with many other young children in Auschwitz. Following the liberation, we moved to a sanatorium to recuperate. I weighed 96 pounds. After several months, my dad suggested we not return to Lithuania, but instead to America to join other family members who had migrated to the United States after the First World War. We made contact with dad's brother in New York, and after several weeks, we found out that Lithuania was considered an enemy country. The quota was very low, and the wait was very long. In June of 1945, I went to Munich to register at the university, but didn't have enough credits. One of the administrators recommended a retired professor who could prepare me for the fall semester. I moved in with him and his family. We spent every day studying all the subject I needed for the entrance exam. We shared the food packages I was getting from my family in the States. I had always dreamed of becoming a doctor, but the study would have taken too long. I didn't want to spend that much time in Germany, so instead I decided to become an electronics engineer. Shortly after graduating with a master's degree, my visa came through. My uncle Irvin brought us to the U.S. Two weeks later, my dad and his wife arrived. My dad had remarried in Germany. After I settled in with my uncle family, I took postgraduate courses in the evenings in physics and business administration while working during the day as an engineer at Columbia, CBS Columbia. That period of time was like a dream, meeting my father's family and having fun. I learned to speak English by watching television, especially Hopalong Cassidy. <laughs> my cousins showed me any pla many places in New York. After almost one year in New York, I moved to California, where I met my wife and started an electronic business. After I sold the business, I joined the family business, C. Marcus Hardware, and I was there till 1993. But in the meantime, I started developing real estate, and I'm still involved. Through the years, I had nightmares of Nazis chasing me, but I always woke up just before they caught me. I often wondered why my children never asked me more questions about the war. When I finally asked him why, they told me they didn't want to upset me. I made videotapes of my war experience for each of my three daughters to keep. The final telling of the whole story was extremely emotional. I couldn't stop crying. It is a matter of history that when Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, found the victims of the death camp, he ordered all possible photographs to be taken and for the German people from surrounding villages to be ushered through the camps and even made to bury the dead. He did this because he said in words to this effect, get it all down on record now. Get the films, get the witnesses, because some were down, track of history, some bastard will get up and say that this never happened. While it's my fervent hope that people will learn from history that no one should be persecuted because of race, religion, or color of skin, I fear that it is not going to happen for a long time. Therefore, we have to keep talking about the Holocaust and keep reminding the world that nothing like that should ever happen again. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.